We continue in our discussion of the five points of TULIP, T-U-L-I-P, which we said is an excellent summary of the gospel itself. Since the gospel begins with a proclamation of the law of God with a view to bringing the sinner to total despair of himself, which leads to an understanding that his only hope is in God the Father's unconditional election, God the Son's limited atonement, God the Spirit's irresistible grace, and since salvation is of the Father, by the Son, and through the Spirit, it is and must be an everlasting salvation. There is no good news. Ever since the fall of man, there is no good news other than this good news. And we have recently seen in our discussions that this doctrine, the first uh, point of the five, uh, which is to say total depravity is an eminently practical doctrine. We saw that uh, it is closely related to the concept of discipline, which is all but disappeared in our society, uh, and specifically the concept of spanking. Uh, people cannot control their children because they do not spank their children, which according to the scripture means they do not love their children. He that spareth the rod hateth his son. He that spareth the rod hateth his son. He that spareth the rod hateth his son. Repeat that to yourself about 15 or 20 times. It is very arresting, is it not? But it is the truth of God. We saw in our last segment that uh, total depravity is not only extremely practical because it deals with and is inextricably connected with the concept of discipline, but it also is eminently practical because without belief in the doctrine of total depravity, there is no belief in the extremely important doctrine of hell. Without belief in total depravity, there is no belief in hell, and our generation and the church of today is proving this beyond any doubt or cavil. Um, why is it that we very, very seldom hear a message on the subject of hell, since it's so important in the scriptures, so important. Christ, it is said correctly, spoke much more of hell than he did of heaven. So why is it that we hear so little about hell in our churches and the only rational explanation I can come up with is that we have ceased to believe in hell. After all, if we believe in Christ, we believe in the God who saves us according to 1 Thessalonians 1.10. Even Jesus, which delivereth us from the wrath to come. If we deny the state and condition from which Christ saves us, and if we believe in a different condition from which Christ saves us, we believe, indeed, in a different Christ. Now, today we want to discuss yet another practical point, which is inextricably connected with the doctrine of total depravity, and that is the very important uh, doctrine in Scripture of repentance. Repentance seems to be going by the wayside also in our churches. Uh, and so we must deal with this most important topic and specifically as it relates to the teaching of sin, to the teaching of total depravity. What is repentance? According to the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Shorter Catechism in particular, a repentance unto life is a saving grace whereby a sinner out of a true sense of his sin and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ doth with grief and hatred of his sin turn from it unto God with full purpose of and endeavor after new obedience. Repentance unto life is a saving grace. Note very carefully. Repentance is a grace of God. A sinner cannot and will not come up with repentance on his own. 
contrary to popular belief, a sinner is not free to repent since it is a saving grace according to uh, the scriptures most importantly and also according to confessional Christianity in our day uh, I think we could safely say that the uh, doctrine of repentance is understood as meaning that uh, a person in order to believe in Christ must and this is what uh, preachers of our day seek to lead people to do uh, lead people to understand and lead people to make uh, to perform uh, some response or to demonstrate some response as a result of their teaching and that is that they're teaching people that they need to repent owing to the fact that they've violated God's law now what could possibly be wrong with that and the answer is nothing is wrong with that but for the fact that uh, primarily man does not with respect to saving repentance a repentance which leads to salvation uh, the sinner does not primarily when he repents does not primarily repent of anything that he does let me repeat that with respect to repentance which leads to salvation the sinner does not primarily repent of anything or any specific sin that he commits primarily he repents of what he is however the majority teaching in our church today merely seeks to get the sinner to admit that he has violated God's holy law and therefore needs to repent of the fact that he has committed certain individual transgressions and he therefore needs to believe in Jesus uh, because salvation consists in repentance uh, and faith so he needs to admit that he's committed certain sins and that he therefore needs to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and again we pose the question what is wrong with this preaching to repeat ourselves because this is such an important point the thing is wrong with this teaching is that man uh, man's problem isn't merely that he commits certain individual transgressions or that he commits a lifetime of individual transgressions man's main problem is that he commits these transgressions and these transgressions we could say from a saving uh, viewpoint of a viewpoint related to a soteriolog soteriology which is the doctrine of salvation uh, individual transgressions are only important insofar as they demonstrate what the sinner is which is to say they're important only insofar as they show that the sinner is by nature a sinner for example, uh, we don't speak of apples because uh, apple is primarily because an apple is uh, is only a demonstration of the type of tree which it grows on, uh, and uh, the the apple tree produces apples, and the apples demonstrate that this is the kind of tree we're looking at, and. Uh, correspondingly the sinner commits certain individual transgressions owing to the fact that he is by nature a sinner as the apple tree is by nature an apple tree and therefore produces apples so the sinner is by nature the sinner and cannot but sin and so everything that he does every action which is produced by this a person who is a sinner by nature can only be yet another act of sin now this is so serious this preaching of repentance that the sinner merely needs to repent of certain deeds that he's done he's told lies he's uh, hated his neighbor he's lusted after a member of the other uh, sex uh, these individual transgressions uh, are said to be the reason 
uh, why the sinner needs to repent. He needs to repent of these individual transgressions and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. In our last session, we mentioned the form uh, of evangelism, the method of evangelism, which is entitled Evangelism Explosion. And evangelism explosion in seeking to get a sinner to understand his sin merely says, what is sin? Sin consists in things such as lying, cheating, stealing, adultery, etc. However, evangelism explosion never gets to the nature of the problem itself. And the nature of the problem is that these individual transgressions are only important insofar as they demonstrate what you are by nature. And what you are by nature is the very opposite of what God demands you to be. And we would say that evangelism explosion along with most of the other forms and methods of evangelism is guilty of the cardinal error in all that we call religion. Let me say that again. Evangelism explosion along with most other methods of evangelism including the four spiritual laws is guilty of the cardinal error in all that what in all that we call religion. Now what is the cardinal error in all that we call religion? The cardinal error in all that we call religion is the error of defining sin solely in terms of actions. Why is that the cardinal error in all that we call religion? And the answer is that the difference between true religion and false religion is what? The difference between true religion and false religion is the presence of Christ. The presence of Christ distinguishes true religion from false religion. And the next question is why is Christ necessary? The only answer is that Christ is necessary because the sinner sees himself to be totally without what God demands that he has. And what God demands that he has is a perfect what God demands that he have is a perfect righteousness. Matthew 5:48 says, "Be ye therefore perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect." God demands that he have a perfect righteousness, and he is the exact opposite, as he discovers through the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit, through the proclamation of the law of God, he discovers that he is the very opposite of that which God demands that he be. And so, his only hope is, as the Apostle Paul says, his gospel is repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. His only hope in seeing himself to be totally destitute of what God demands that he be and have, his only hope is faith in repentance toward God, realizing that he has nothing of what God demands that he have. And faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ means that he sees that his only hope is in the perfect righteousness of Christ which is imputed to the believing sinner through the faith which the Holy Spirit works irresistibly works in him in the preaching of the gospel and through which faith Christ's perfect righteousness is imputed unto us and we can stand in the presence of an infinitely holy God so we see that repentance primarily is not repentance of anything that you do. Repentance which re leads to salvation is not repentance of anything primarily that you do, but repentance of what you are by nature and casting oneself on the Lord Jesus Christ as his only hope to stand before the presence and in the presence of an infinitely holy God. And so repentance is inextricably connected with the doctrine of total depravity. Amen.